Welcome, you guys. How are you? Ah, uh, it's great to be Thank here. You. That's yeah. awesome. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Let's start by having you tell us a little bit about yourselves and your family and what you want the listeners to really know about you. Yeah. You tackle? What they really want to know. I can tell them. <laughs> <laughs> no, so um, like we said, we've been married, I think almost, well, 15 years next year together for half of our lives. Um, and together we've created businesses together and separately, but we do do a lot of our things together. So um, I think we're multi-passionate entrepreneurs. And like you mentioned in the bio, I have three passions that I love to work on. We love to work on our first is our Village Impact um, that we founded over 10 years ago now, um, where we help bring education to students in Kenya by partnering with organizations on the ground and making that happen. That led to me creating Lady Strength, which was selfishly, I mean, when I started Lady Strength, Stu was already well entrenched in the online world and his own business. And I wasn't quite there yet. So I invited women over to my living room that liked business. Um, and really like my mastermind in that lady strength community started from me trying to find my own network of women entrepreneurs because you were so far ahead in that kind of space and I wasn't there yet. So that kind of stemmed there. And then my latest passion, as you said, is really an Airbnb business and creating You've really made your stride with that. Yes, I've kind of, after all those things, like, and like we said, bios, that's like a 15 year lifespan. That is okay. like one thing that led to another that has me now in this Airbnb space, just creating more experiences for people. And that's a big thing between, a big kind of thread between our life and our family life is it's all about having an impact, but then creating experiences for people. We will take experiences over, over stuff. our stuff any day of the week. Yeah. So that's a bit about my story. Yeah, and we, you know, I think one of the fun things about it is that uh, um, Amy and I have been together throughout the entire journey. So, you know, when I started off as an entrepreneur, I wasn't making hardly any money. You know, I, you know, I was living in my parents' basement. You know, I was uh, eating peanut butter and jam sandwiches, and you know, just trying to figure it out. And, and you would go to an event, and he would have one pizza, and he would make that pizza pizza last three days. <laughs> yeah, I would just have like one piece for like you know uh, lunch, and come back, and then one piece for dinner, and I'd make it last the whole week. So, Amy's, you know, we've been together this entire time, and it's just been. Uh, an incredible journey because we have grown so much uh, as a couple throughout that journey. And uh, it's fun now, like when we look back on where we were and, you know, what has happened. Um, and then it's also exciting to look forward, like, you know, where we are now and like where we will be in five years, 10 years. And, uh, and I think one of the things that I appreciate about Amy is that, you know, she's pushed me in many, many ways in many areas of my life. And she's opened my eyes to, a whole lot of uh, incredible things, including, you know, the work that we do with the charity. And at the end of the day, it's made me, you know, a, a more successful businessman because of, you know, the insights that she's brought. And it's just helped me be able to expand my world and ultimately reach more people, impact more people, and, you know, uh, certainly do a whole lot more for our family. So I'm super grateful. You know, we, we met at, you know, university, <laughs> and uh, it took me a long time to convince her that I was the man of her dreams, but I finally did. And uh, it's been an you were amazing a salesman life. from the start. I love. I know. It. <laughs> I had to be. Important oh, sale you God. ever made, Stu. <laughs> it was. It took me a long time. Seven years. Seven years. But um, yeah, finally. Uh, I don't know whether she was convinced or she was just uh, tired of me. You know. No, it's funny though <laughs> when you talk about relationships, and I share this in my book where. You know, we joke about it, but at the same time, it was really the start of a really healthy relationship where, you know, in my younger days, I, and still now, like with traveling abroad and doing all these things that I love to do, never once did Stu say like, you know, when we're in our twenties, don't go, I don't want you to go. I'm going to miss you. I think you should stay. And like, he was always, oh, that's great. Have fun. Like, see you, see you later. And like, what can I do to help you? And I really like that, I think is such an amazing trait to have. And I do believe that it, it kept us like as a couple, because it's, I'm so independent that that, you know, that kind of having somebody say, no, don't go. And like, I'm like, oh, I'm like, no, like I like our couple, but then I'm 
a fiercely independent woman as well. So I think it just offered that great balance. And, and I just kept showing up at the airport with flowers each time. And I'd be like, I'm still here. I'm still here. Hey, hey. <laughs> Literally that we call that differentiation in kind of the marriage, whatever, but that's one of the best kept secrets of a healthy, thriving relationship is to differentiate like that. So you guys are such a great example of that. I love it so much. You may not know this, but my pretty much my favorite word in the English language right now is passion. Like I love this word. So when I saw Amy, this book, Passion to Purpose, I literally could not get my hands on it fast enough. I got it. I read it cover to cover. I'm so excited to dive in here with you guys. Are you guys ready? Yes, let's, <laughs> let's do it. So can you define the word passion for us? Like, tell us what it really means to both of you. Yeah. So, well, passion to us and to myself is like, you know, that true engagement with something that you really, really love. And I, it makes me think of, you know, a couple of examples of like us as a couple, when we go skiing, like I am passionate about skiing. I love skiing, downhill skiing. I used to race. I, I really enjoy it. And we were in Whistler when, well, this winter, or this was several years ago, and I get into a zone when I ski and like you, everything else like falls away. Cause I'm so, I enjoy it so much and I'm going down the hill and I'm like turning a mountain and then I stop and I don't see him. I turn around. I don't see Stu. I like keep going some more. And then I'm like, well, maybe I should wait. Like, I don't know where he's gone. And then sure enough, he comes down and he's covered in snow. His goggles are like falling off. And he's like, why didn't you wait? But she's I, left me in the dust. I did, just but, <laughs> but it's like, I just get into a zone. And I think when you're truly passionate about something, everything else kind of falls away because you just love it so much and you enjoy what you're doing. And it like brings out the best version of yourself. Right. And, um, and then I think I've even my daughter, Marla, she's passionate about reading. Like she is a reading machine and she will sit in her book and she, you could do anything around her, but she's so into the character and the plot and what's happening in her story. And so passionate. So, about so much so that we often find her like, uh, sneaking away, you know, she'll be on the toilet, just sitting on the toilet, like with door, you know, because it's quiet and like nobody's disturbing her. She's just reading, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, or she'll share what's <laughs> happening in the story, and it's so intense. And like, it's just, yeah, for me, that's. I and I, th I think the same thing. Like, you know, passion is just the things that you would do, you know, all day long, uh, regardless of whether you made money, didn't make money, whether you know somebody was telling you or not telling you, it was just something that you just loved doing, you know. It's and, like what you go to dinner parties and what you love talking about all the time. And, you and, talk I, and I think at the end of the day, like the ultimate scenario is if you can do the things that you love and make money uh, mm -hmm. with it as well. And that's why I said like earlier that Amy's really hit her stride with uh, her like our luxury Airbnb. You know, this wasn't something that she just instantly knew what that she wanted to do this, but she last year when we uh, launched it, you know, Amy loves creating experiences for people. And what's ultimately happened is because of that passion for creating experiences, we are able to charge three times the average nightly rate for Airbnbs in our area. And we get rebookings and referrals pretty much from every single guest. So like next year's calendar is already booked out. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is because she loves the details. She loves creating the experiences and then people rave about it. And she's got five stars everywhere. And after this year, we we're both like, this is your thing. Like this is, you know, sometimes you know, it's your thing. Sometimes you don't and you discover it's your thing, but the passion really comes out when you just can't stop thinking about it and you obsess about it and you love it. And that's 100% the case with, you know, Amy recently with, you know, the Airbnb experience. Yeah. Yeah, that's so amazing. And like, it's so neat to think about. And what, what I actually really enjoyed about this book is because you take passion one step further and make it like your purpose. So one of the things you do so well is you lay out for us these simple steps on how to harness the passion inside of us and use it to fuel our contribution. In fact, you say, this is a direct quote, we realized early on that following our passions was medicine for everything, from cultivating deep inner joy to strong and supportive relationships with, of course, ding, 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 I got goosebumps. Can you talk about that? Yeah, like I really, I, I wrote the book um, because people would often come up to us after events where we would speak about the nonprofit and, and they're like, I 
you know, I really want to do that, but I can't because I don't have a big enough business or I don't know what I'm passionate about or I don't, I don't have a nonprofit. I I, yeah, I could never start a charity. Or I don't have as, as much money to build a classroom. And, you know, Stu and I would talk about it a lot and, and I would begin to get frustrated because I'm like, you do not have to have your own business to make a difference. You don't have to have your own nonprofit to make a difference. Yes, we've started and run several businesses and nonprofit, but that's like what we love to do. It's all intertwined into our passion. But I wrote that because it's like, there are more ways to harness your passion and use it to do more good. It's like your passion is your vehicle to do more good in the world. So one of the ways that we do it as a family is like we shared with experiences, that's a huge thing for us. And so we gift experiences to our family and friends and coworkers. And they're usually travel related experiences because I mean, we're big into traveling. Like so a good like example, like that. every year, we as a family decided to create a super surprise for mm -hmm. somebody in our life, whether it be a family member, whether it be a close friend, mm -hmm. and we create the ultimate, you know, dream experience for them that they may not otherwise be able to, you know, provide for themselves. Or, you know, it's like those scenarios where somebody may want to do it and may have the means to do it, but they just never make the time to do it. And so, you know, we love creating these experiences for people and it's, that's just become a part of, you know, what we do as a family. And I think the more you can interweave your passions uh, to do more good in the world, like uh, the more fun it becomes. And so the thing that lights us up is like, when we are gifting those experiences or even participating in those experiences uh, that we give, uh, because that's what we love to do. We love to create those experiences. That's something that Amy and I are both passionate about. And then we also love uh, to uh, experience that with, you know, people like our friends and our family and so forth and create those memories. And I think, you know, as Amy has mentioned, there are all kinds of ways to use the thing that you're passionate about to do more good in the world. And, you know, in some cases, it might be creating a nonprofit. In other cases, it may not be. Listen, creating a nonprofit, there's a whole lot of things that go into that. You know, there's a whole lot of red tape. There's a whole lot of, it's like running a business with a whole another layer of complexity into it because you have to adhere to a whole bunch of regulations and so forth. So it's not something that we would recommend that everybody go and do. But there are all kinds of ways that you could do more good with the things that you're passionate about. Uh, that are well beyond, you know, starting your own nonprofit. And I think that's one of the things that used to, you know, irritate us in a way when we'd have these conversations is people thinking and mistakenly that the only way to do more good is to start your own nonprofit. Or, or to give, to give a lot of money when it's, you know, you can change someone's life by showing up and smiling and saying hello, or, you know, championing someone and um, in your community, or, you know, if you're really into bike riding and, you know, going on a bike ride with another friend and just experiencing that passion together of riding a bike. And like, there's just so many different things that we can do and you don't have to wait. Like we can all do it today. Like we can all start today. In that. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I think that's a, a big part of, you know, when Amy was writing, writing the book, I'm, I'm obviously a proud <laughs> husband. I have it everywhere I go. And, um, but uh, when she was writing the book, you know, this was a big part that we had uh, many discussions around was just, you know, that notion of, look, you can start today, no matter where you are, what stage you're at in your life, um, you can start today and weave the things that you're passionate into, the, you know, uh, you know, doing more good for others. Um, you just got to be intentional about it. Oh, I love that. Well, speaking of the start, I want to like dig into the start of Village Impact a little bit. I know it wasn't called that in the beginning. I know it didn't even, it wasn't even defined at all in the beginning, but like I'm a relationship researcher. That's my passion. And I want to know like about those first few conversations where Amy was like, I want to do something meaningful. So let's raise a bunch of money and take it down to South America. I think, I think it went something like I'll arrange the travel and you figure out how to raise all the money. And we only have a couple of weeks to do it. So let's go. Right. I feel yeah. like I need more insight into how that all went down and kind of what you were both thinking about that first trip. Yeah. So you shared a lot, basically in a nutshell what had happened. And that kind of all took place on our couch while watching Oprah's Big Give. And we were, you know, it was an exciting Friday night. We ha I had a glass of wine, you had some water and we were watching TV. <laughs> and it was, um, I was, I mean, I was at a point in my teaching career where I, um, I liked it, but I didn't love it. And I 
I was always you were looking for something. I was always looking for things, other things that I could do that involved travel and giving back. And yeah, we were watching Oprah's Big Give, and I just said to Stu, I'm like. I, I want to do that. Like that is what I want to do. And it went down pretty much as you said, but I think inside Stu was like, well, I was just trying to be the supportive, <laughs> you know, uh, spouse. I was just like, sure, honey. Like, you know, whatever you want to do, like I'll, I'll support you. And then next thing I know, like, you know, we're raising a bunch of money and she's arranged this trip and we're heading to El Salvador. And I know like we knew no one where we were going and, you know, we end up, she finds this like village in the, top of this mountain you know they don't speak a word of english we don't speak a word of spanish there was a whole lot of acting going on to try to communicate um but somehow we figured it out and amy always said to me before that trip she said look you know you'll appreciate and understand the impact that you have when you give when you see the people that you're giving to you know because we had always you know wrote checks for different causes and and so forth but amy prior to that point had done a lot of traveling where she would go and she would spend time with, you know, people uh, who had a variety and, of different needs. And that was the biggest part for me on that first trip was, you know, being a teacher at the time, I only had that two week window and I'm like, okay, we're going to go live with a family. Cause I'm a big, like, that's part of what I love to do is learning about other cultures and being immersed in that other family and, and learning about them, but learning about myself and like how we can work together and, um, so we did, we lived with the host family and it, like, I love that stuff. And we lived with this family. We learned about as much as we could in that short time. I mean, I wish it could have been longer, but you know, we did the best with what we had available to us at that time. And, and I just remember like good. coming home on the plane and we're sitting together and I, I remember looking at her and I said, okay, like, I get it. You know, I understand, like, let's, let's figure out how to make this, you know, a more formal process. Mm -hmm. And so at that point, we started, I say we, Amy, uh, started the process of like figuring out how to become a nonprofit. It's called Google. Yeah. At that time. And, uh, <laughs> but in Canada, like it's a, it takes a long time. Like traditionally it would take anywhere between seven to eight years. But uh, Amy is like, she is relentless. Like when she gets something in her mind, it's just like, just get out of the way. And just, you know, it's just easier to get out of the way. So like, for example, you know, she would do all the things that would need to be done. And then she'd call the, you know, the government, you know, agency that was in charge of like approving blah, blah, blah. And, and, the, and she was just like constantly calling them and she would take well, notes because, of like who she was speaking yeah. to and, and what they were saying. And then they said to her, like, okay, they're trying to just get her off, you know, stop. and so they gave her like this 21 page document that she had to fill out and do all this stuff. And so that night she like fills the whole thing out and calls back again the next morning. It was just like, I just faxed it through. And they're just like, what the heck lady? So they were trying to like delay it. And finally they, I think they just gave us nonprofit status just to get rid of Amy. Like, um, yeah. but we ended up getting it in like two years, which we, is pretty incredible. Yeah, we got it a lot sooner. Um, but one thing that I think was really helpful in getting that was my folder where, you know, and I still do it to this day. Like when I'm trying to figure something out, or, you know, you're calling people and they say, oh, you have to talk to this person and then it take you and then you have to call back. And um, so I had a whole chart or a whole like, spreadsheet of when I spoke to that person what we spoke about and what they said and then like I would keep it so I could refer back and say oh well when I spoke to Todd at you know 3 p.m on blah 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 this is what they said and they're so I think that that was just helpful but I, yeah. <laughs> they knew if they didn't take care of you they were gonna like <laughs> had it all recorded back them down. <laughs> yeah I love that so much so so here's what I think is just so impressive, right? Like Amy's relentless, Stu, you were the supportive husband, but at some point you really just kind of, you, you saw it, you saw the vision, you caught the vision that Amy at the beginning, I think was mostly yours, right? So I want to. I want to know what you would say to the man or woman who's starting to recognize and nurture their passion, but they're not so sure how their friends and family, specifically their, their spouse, um, is, is going to feel about it and, and, you know, if they'll support it or not. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think, um, you know, we kind of touched on it earlier. I was just very tuned into the fact that like, um, the way in which I could show up and be, you know, the best husband is to be supportive of what, you know, Amy wants to do. It's not like, I'm trying to mold and shape Amy into becoming a person that uh, she's not. I'm really like trying to amplify 
who she already is, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And so she's always had a passion for travel. And I've known that since, you know, we were in university together, you know, uh, the first four years that we were together, she was gone two and a half of those years traveling somewhere. And so I, I've always known that she's had this passion for travel. I've always known that she's had this passion for, you know, giving, you know, to others as well. And so I think at some point, like if you really truly love uh, the, your spouse or your partner or whoever you're with, you, you've got to kind of take a step back and you've got to, you know, ask yourself like, how, how can I support them in doing more of what they love? How can I amplify them? And in doing so, what ends up happening is like, they become, you know, whether it's um, consciously or subconsciously more grateful and more excited and more alive. And they become more of the very person that you're attracted to in the beginning, yeah. you know? And so we even see it with our kids. Like, you know, uh, I have played, you know, high level sports my entire life. And so, you know, I was just hoping, wishing, praying that one of the kids would show an interest in some sport, didn't matter what sport it was. I'm like, I'm all in, you know? But neither of our kids have really shown an interest in sports whatsoever. They're more at craft than reading. Yeah. And, and, and so as much as I like want them to get into sports, like it's the same scenario there. Like, again, if I try to force them into something, then it's going to create that conflict. It's, it's not going to, I'm not amplifying who they are, but if we can just keep digging and discovering and eventually find the things that they do enjoy, the things that they're passionate about, and then amplify it they become, you know, more of uh, who they really are. And so I think for me, um, that's always kind of just been ingrained. And I would say the piece of advice that I would give is to have this conversation with your spouse, mm -hmm. uh, your partner, or whoever it might be, whether it be your parents, your, you know, family members, uh, friends, and, and just ask for that support and just say like, this is something that I really love to do. And, and, Honestly, I, I don't know what it will lead to. I don't know if it'll ever become a thing, but it's just something that I love to do. And knowing that you love me, I would just love to have your support in being able to maybe figure this out and try it out. And, uh, and here's what that support looks like. Because I think sometimes we ask for support, but you know, we don't uh, ask for the kind of support that we're looking for. So some of us, you know, we may like somebody to give us advice or guidance, or does this look good? Or is this, am I on track? And some of us may be sensitive to that and be like, you know, that kind of thing could easily deter us and shut us down. And so I think we've got to get clear ourselves in terms of what kind of support that, you know, best fuels us and best supports us. And then similarly, like ask for that support, you know, so for me, like, I'm definitely like my love language is words of affirmation. Oh, and you know, yeah okay so I had a, a coach when I was in um when I played soccer who was the complete opposite of that he was very like you know um uh like I don't know very hard on the players you know what I mean yeah, yeah. and um and I I didn't thrive in that environment whereas I contrast that to another coach that I had who was very supportive, very, you know, um, uh, positive. And he would find, if I messed up five times, he'd find that one time that I did something good and he'd focus on that. And what ended up happening was I became a far better player and I performed at a far higher level. And that's because, uh, and that really taught me like, you know, what kind of support that I, you know, thrive with. And so I think it's about self-awareness, like, you know, how do you like to receive support? And then communicating that to your significant other uh, to be able to get that support. So sometimes you're not going to know, you know, uh, where everything is going to lead. And as much as we want to come to our par partner or spouse and say, okay, here's the plan. Here's what I think is going to happen. Blah, 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 blah. You may not know. And, and that's okay. Uh, it's just about like being upfront and transparent about that uncertainty and just asking for support in terms of just being able to figure it out. Yeah. yeah. So you, you talk about that in the book, how, how the middle was just super messy. Like you, you had no idea what was coming and what would it, it would become. And talk about that for a few minutes, Amy, because yeah, yeah, like it just, it no, was an I, evolution and it, it, I mean, it's so amazing. We're going to talk about just a second where you are now, but yeah, I know no, it's that. really, um, there was like Sue saying that, like supporting your spouse that way. And I'd also add to that. And, and it kind of helps with the messy middle where, you know, we, it's being open to those moments of that messiness and then being open to what 
what that journey could be because and in, and in, in all the things that I love by myself and that you you didn't really love at the beginning I think we've also found some commonalities of like things that we both like together that maybe you would have at the beginning been like oh no that's not my thing but as like the nonprofits grown and have we done stuff together we found actually some new things that we actually do enjoy doing together so I think being open to that for sure and yeah I mean at the beginning it was messy like I came to you with the idea we did it together we did two fundraising um act, two fundraisers that went extremely well um but at that point we were running we were running it through our business for these donations because we just didn't know I hadn't set up the charity and I was still waiting but I didn't want to wait because I'm not very patient but I didn't want to <laughs> wait until we had everything perfect right because I think if we'd waited until we had everything perfect we wouldn't have helped all the other people that we did or I wouldn't have we wouldn't have figured out the direction we wanted to go with a nonprofit and who we wanted to work with um, because that was kind of things we we're figuring out along the way um, but it, it was messy and and I would say like um, we're still figuring stuff out you know like we, everyone's still yeah we, <laughs> we don't have everything figured out like um, a perfect example of this is like Amy you know loves to travel and if she uh, could wave a magic wand she would be gone pretty much every week and she'd be surrounded by a whole lot of people and she'd be you know involved in some experience i'm more introverted so like i i, I like crave you know downtime so we communicate about this a lot like we just moved into our new home and Amy's like, oh, okay, great. So we're going to have uh, this party. We're going to have these people over. We'll have this gathering. We'll plan for this. And I was just like, <laughs> I'm like, baby, can we just like budget in some weekends where we do nothing? And she's like, what? And I was just like, like, I, I, I would just love like nothingness, you know, budget into the, the calendar as well. So we're still like, we still communicate. We still figure this stuff out. And I think, I th that I think that's important in a relationship. I think we figured out the travel stuff because that was a big thing where we were completely different. And I'm very thankful that we're both entrepreneurs now and, and have that flexibility to come and go and do pretty much whatever we'd like to when it comes to travel. So now I take trips by myself or with friends um, more regular than we do, not more than our family, I'd say, but definitely once or twice a year, there are a couple of girlfriend solo trips in there to kind of fill my travel to offset to the offset that. yeah <laughs> um, but we do we're still we talked about this this weekend because you know I over plan I put too much on the calendar and I even said before we had this interview I was like oh no like I created this experience again for a, a Dover Lake House adventure challenge and I've got like seven teams of two going all over the town finding clues to win two nights at our lake house but it turned into this big thing with prizes and everything. And I'm like, why did I, why did I do that? <laughs> but I just like it so much. And I, I love that, but it's taken some of the weekend. And so we're like, well, okay, we need to look for the next few weeks and make sure that we put in time, downtime and not time where we're hosting or running or doing things. Um, oh. <laughs> so self-awareness, communication, those are the two keys. Oh yeah. gosh. I love that. Cause I, I, I want to dig into this just like a little bit more, but I feel like in real time, you just gave us a really good example of that in the McLaren household, but <laughs> you guys have worked together really closely utilizing your individual strengths, talents, and your relationships that you've built, you know, over the things that you've done to build village impact into this incredible global charity that it is today. I think you can update me if I'm wrong, but I think 14 schools in Kenya delivering education to nearly 5,000 students every day. We're working on a girls school, I think is mm -hmm. like so incredible. Can you give us just a few examples of how maybe you didn't see eye to eye on something or one of you, maybe when one of you was overwhelmed and ready to give up, like how did you support each other and get through the really hard stuff? Yeah, no, it's, I can think of a couple right off my head, but one thing that we really I'm found, interested to hear what your, uh, your, I your one might be the same <laughs> so My first one would be like, you know, like Stu said at the beginning, he is not good with details. Like, it's kind of crazy when you think like we have several companies or, you know, when you, you know, have 50 or 60 staff on one and, but he doesn't like details. So I, I am the person in the house where at first I would try and get Stu with our financial planner and accountants and being like, okay, we need to have a meeting and we need to do this. Can like asking him what he thought about this and that. And he would just zone out and he would be like, we would go in our meeting with our financial planner and our accountants. And 
they're like, yeah. And they're telling me this stuff. And I'm like, yeah. And Stu's just like, literally one time he was even, you were reading on the floor. You weren't even paying attention. Like it just, <laughs> he, it goes all over, like not over his head, but he's just not into it. It's not his strength. Like show him a few numbers and he's good, but like all the planning that goes into things. So I, I realized then that that's my role and we stay in our lanes. Like I am the person that talks to the lawyers, talks to the tax accountants, like am the one moving the ship on all those sides. And now I, and that's what I do. And I sometimes don't like it, but I know I need to, I'm the person that will make it move. And instead of trying to get him to do it mm. and on it, that's not a strength of his, like I'm, it is a stronger suit of mine that I'm able to so do. To, so to yeah, answer your question, your a point of, a point of conflict, definitely in the beginning was that Amy was really wanting me to uh, mm -hmm. take more of a uh, leadership role over the details. And I'm like on a scale of one to 10 with 10 being like amazing at details, I'm like a two. So, you know, getting a two to a 10 is really difficult, you know? And I think that at some point, like Amy, she's naturally like a seven or an eight uh, on the detail scale. So for her, uh, this was a point of conflict because, you know, she was like, well, she was trying to get me to become that details person. And it's just, it's, it it's just really hard. Like <laughs> I am just not that person. Um, to the point now where like, here we are 15 years later, where people reach out to me for that kind of I they just, all the stuff they just come to me because yeah. they know that I will be the one that that, that will makes it happen make it happen or they'll come to your assistant for its work stuff because they know and but the flip but, side yeah. is also true which is like when I'm not in that area because it's not a strength of mine I have more capacity to stay in my area of strengths where I'm I am playing at a nine and a ten mm -hmm. and when I do that like magic can happen you know and so we both realized like very early in our relationship where our strengths uh, were and to stay in our lanes and uh, and to be accepting of, you know, those strengths and similarly those weaknesses. Um, I'll tell you one other uh, point of conflict specifically with the with the charity. So we were looking to build our very first school and we knew nothing about building schools like this was like completely brand spanking new. We were working with this amazing woman in, in uh, Kenya who we still work with to this day. Her name is Irene. We call her the Mother Teresa of Africa. She's amazing. And um, she was showing us uh, around different communities that were in need of a potential school. So we, we uh, go to this one community, we meet uh, the community. They're amazing people. And this is like out in the middle of nowhere in Kenya. Like no running water, no electricity, in many cases, like not even roads, like the homes are built of mud and sticks, like we're way out in the middle of nowhere. And uh, I remember talking to the chairman of this community and, you know, we're trying to figure out like how much things cost and we're getting all the details. And then uh, afterwards we get back into the van and Irene says to us, okay, so um, to kind of break it down, here's what it would cost to build the school. And at the time, the cost was around $120,000 to build the school. And she says this number. And in my mind, I'm like, gulp. Like, I'm like, geez, Louise, like, we, we don't, we don't, we don't have $120,000 in the, in fact, we had about $300 in the charity yeah, bank account. $342. And, and I remember like Irene saying like, you know, I, I can try to bring together some other organizations and maybe this can be a collaborative effort. And Amy just looks at her dead in the eyes and she says, no, we got it. And I remember like looking at her like, uh, baby cakes, like, you know how much money we got in the, in the charity bank? Y'all like, we, we, we don't have that. And, uh, and she just looks at, you know, Irene, she's like, we'll figure it out. We'll get it. And, uh, and then, so we wrap up that conversation and afterwards I'm like, Amy, like, babes, like, how are we going to, how are we going to raise $120,000? And she's like, we'll figure it out. She's like, you know, and, and, uh, I remember in that moment, like, I, having to borrow some of that courage, you know what I mean? Like borrow some of that like tenacity and be like, okay, like, like we'll, we'll find a way, we'll figure it out. And ultimately what it ended up leading us to was a completely different way of fundraising that has served us from that day forward. And what we did was, you know, her just, you know, um, confidence in us getting to that goal forced me to begin thinking differently and asking different questions because 
the one of the things that we were very clear on was that we weren't going to build a big, you know, organization with, you know, a whole lot of people. In fact, to this day, you know, 14 schools later, more than 5,000 plus kids going to the schools, as you mentioned, it's still a very small team. There's a, a team of five of us in North America and there, and in our team in Kenya is, is it five now? It's four. Four, four in Kenya. So we're a super small team, even to this day. Um, but what we were very clear about was that we didn't want to have a big organization. And so doing fundraising efforts with that involved like hundreds or thousands or even tens of thousands of people felt very overwhelming for us. And we knew if we got overwhelmed, we would shut down and then it wouldn't happen. So we started asking different questions, which was like, okay, how, how could we raise $120,000 with minimal effort? And ultimately it led us to, instead of looking to fundraise a whole lot of uh, money from a whole lot of people, like smaller donations from a whole lot of people, flip it around. And how do we find a small group of people who contribute big donations? And ultimately that is how we built our first school. And there were uh, 12 people who contributed $10,000 for a classroom. And that was our first school built like that. And then the second school came from the same group of people because we went back and we said, hey, we built the elementary school and now the community needs a high school. Would you be in? And they're like, yes. And so this is how it all began. And then from that point forward, like donors started, you know, bringing other friends and colleagues and other people that they knew in uh, and involved them. And it started to blossom from that point forward. But, you know, I think uh, I remember that moment and I remember feeling like, oh my gosh, Amy, like, I don't know about this commitment to it, but we made it happen. But it's funny because at the same side, it's like we both feed off each other. Like before the book came out the night, the day before I did an interview and I felt like it didn't go well. I just was not happy. I shut down my computer and I went into the room. We were at a hotel and I pulled the sheets over my head and I was bawling. And I'm like, I don't want to do this. I've made a mistake and I, I'm going down the negative like thing. And that's where Sue, you're, I mean, your number one is <laughs> like positivity and encouragement. And like, you know, I, you pull me back up on t- probably more than I have to pull him back up. But I think that's where we, you know, I was brave there, but then there's also times that I'm not. And it's, you know, saying those encouraging words and like helping each other get through those is just so important because you are the more, um, we're both pretty positive, but you are, I think I've only been the one ever gone out of the bed. Let's go. But it's just helping each other, right? And playing off each other's strengths to get through those times. And, and to that point, like in those points of conflict, I think oftentimes the best thing that we have ever done is we, we often take a step back and, and we, we try to borrow each other's strengths. So in that moment in Kenya, I was borrowing Amy's confidence, you know, in that moment when she had a, a breakdown, she was borrowing my, you know, outlook and positivity. And so I, we do that a lot, you know, and we bounce off each other in that way. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I think that that allows us both to maintain perspective of where the point of conflict is happening and then be able to move through it, you know? And so sometimes you just got to have that trust in your partner um, and, you know, in both ways uh, to be able to move through those points of tension. Um, and that's certainly been, uh, been the case for us. That's really good. Like I, I, you're probably just going to rephrase your answer for this question, but I want to ask it because it's really good because you guys juggle so much. You have your individual passions, your beautiful family, your business and all the things, multiple businesses. I want to know what's your secret sauce? Like, how do you manage to keep it all going? Hmm. Help. (laughs) Like we've, um, I think that's one of the first things So one of the first things we ever did, which was by far the best investment we ever, ever made was eight, more or less 10. So like nine years ago, we, um, we opted to get help at home. And this was a struggle for me being a mom and a female and like, you know, wanting to do all the things, but we were realizing that it was causing a lot of stress. Like, Like, okay, let's talk about simple, practical things that were causing stress. So You know, everything that we do in our life, we do to try to eliminate stress, you know? Um, And so here's the things that were causing stress before we got help. Laundry. Now, uh, point blank, neither of us like doing laundry. And I was notorious for buying like legit hundreds of t-shirts. 
and so that like I'd have this big stack of t-shirts and then I would just keep going down, down, down through the stack. And meanwhile, like the laundry pile is just like going the other way. And then Amy, two weeks later, would be like, yo, uh, we going to do this? And we'd be like, oh, yeah, it's like this whole thing. So then we'd throw it all in and we'd do multiple loads of laundry. And then we'd forget. And then there would be a load that was still in the washing machine. It'd be wet and stinky. And we'd have to do it all again. And it was just like this whole thing. And it created a ton of stress. That's an example. Another example that would cause stress is cooking. Like we both don't like cooking. So we would have like this standoff at night. Like, you know, whether we realize we, we would be secretly hoping that the other person was going to start dinner first because they got hungry first. And then by <laughs> default, like, the, you know, and, and it was awful it, meals. It, it, it was, was just awful like awful meals and we weren't eating healthy. And like, we kind of looked at each other and we're like, okay, we need to get help. And at that point in our careers, like we could, we chose to hire someone to help with all of those things but it was tight. Like we have to say no to several other things to say yes to getting this help at home because, you know, I was teaching during the day, Stu was running wish list and doing all this other stuff. And it was becoming, it was becoming really hard. And we identified all the things we didn't like. And we actually ended up getting someone to help and live in with us. And, and that was a and, whole and you know, it's transition. complete game changer and a transition. And, you know, we're living in this small community. I never known anyone that had lived in help. And we went through this, I went through this identity thing of like, oh no, like, should I get help or not? And, but man, it was the best decision we made as a family because it wasn't, it, it became, and it still is to stay. I still have help. I hope I have help for the rest of my life because what it enables is for us to pay attention to the things that we love most. So it's, I mean, our kids are in school and this wonderful Sheila, amazing Sheila that helps our family. She's like, helps with laundry, helps with cooking. She runs errands for us. Like she does all those little things. She helps manage the Airbnb. Airbnb. She just left today to help manage the Airbnb. And it's funny because at first we're like, oh, you have a nanny, but it's it's not a nanny. Like she's, she's like another person that helps. Um, And it's been like that since well, since we hired our first. And to that point, yeah, like but... it creates more time for us to spend on the things that we mm-hmm. love. So for example, every morning we walk the kids to school. Every afternoon we pick the kids up together. And when the kids come home, like COVID was actually interesting because the kids, when, uh, to the, when they were in school, they just know that when they get picked up, like it's, you know, they're with mom and dad and mom and dad are with them and we're focused on them. We're playing with them. And so when COVID happened, it was interesting because like now they were home during the day. And so for the first time ever, they were seeing us work and they're just like, what, how come you're not like with us like 24 seven, like you normally are, you know what I mean? So it was some adjustment there, but, um, but the point of the matter is, is that that help, it creates capacity for us to focus on the things that matter. And for us spending time with the kids that matters for us, spending time on our businesses, that matters, eating healthy, that matters, exercising, that matters. So that, that just became the priority. And then, I mean, we've had help since Marla was two. And like, like I said, I always love to have help. And for someone that doesn't want to live in or get that kind of help or whatever it has, you want to do it's like picking those things off your list maybe it's just laundry or maybe it's just someone prepping healthy snacks to be in your fridge or you know maybe it's just cleaning it doesn't have to be but getting those little things off so you can focus on what you really want to do and focus on your kids or focus on your family and and it extends even further than that like when amy says help like you know we've given the example of certainly help at home but I think also, you know, from uh, we have a, um, a rental business where we, you know, have both long term uh, rentals and short term rentals. And when we started this several years ago, I said to Amy, like, I, I don't I don't want to be, you know, getting calls in the middle of the night because a toilet is plugged or a sink's not working. I'm like, I am the least handy guy in the world. So like that creates stress for me. And so an example of getting help was we uh, hired a property manager and the property manager, yes, we paid for that, but they eliminate a ton of that stress. And so I think getting help uh, in the areas that create stress in your life is a game changer, whether that's at home, in the business or elsewhere. I think that's such a fantastic example of not falling prey to your circumstances, right? Like get out of that Mm -hmm. box and figure out how to, how, how to, do what you need to do regardless of the circumstances, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, so good. So good. Okay. 
So just a couple more questions. I know you have to go, but what does leaving a legacy mean to you? When all is said and done, what do you hope your posterity and those who knew you best will remember? Well, for me, you know, legacy is such a big word, right? But I think at the end of the day, it's all those little acts that lead to our legacy. Like leaving our legacy starts today. It starts this afternoon. It starts tonight. Like it's all the things that we do and how we show up in life. So in terms of our common legacy is just being kind and helping others and championing others down the road. And I would say the similar thing, like, you know, what, when you ask yourself the question, like, what do you want to be known for? Like Mm -hmm. at the end of the day, what do you want to be known for? We want to be known as generous people. We want to be known as kind people. We want to be known as people who, you know, uh, lift others up. We want to be known as, uh, we want to have great memories with people. And once you get clear on like what it is you want to be known for, then it's a matter of asking like, how, like, how do we, you know, become known as kind? How do we become known as being generous? How do we create experiences for others that people remember for years and years and years? And that's what leads you to getting clarity around the things that you can do day in and day out, you know, that leads to your life. yeah. And, you know, for us, like generosity is not a one-time act, you know, it's like a daily act. It is like, something that is woven into our lives. It's woven into our business. Like a perfect example is like in our business, you know, we've built, woven it right in where uh, our business is primarily membership and subscription. And so we contribute one month of membership to Village Impact. And ultimately like as the business grows, so does the contribution. And it's woven right into the very fabric of who we are. So I think once you get clear on, you know, what you want to be known, uh, you know, for at the end of your life, then it's about asking that question, like, how, how can I weave that in today and make it a daily habit and practice? Can I just plug something? A hundred percent of the proceeds of this book go to yeah. Village Impact, right? So yeah. if you haven't read Passion to Purpose, make sure you grab it because you're- Go get a copy. It's an amazing contribution. Book. Yes. Okay. So final thoughts. If you had the undivided attention of all the entrepreneurs in all the world for just a few minutes, what's the most important thing you could teach them about following their passion to purpose and leaving their legacy? You want to go? You can go first. I would just say, uh, you know, if you're not clear about your passion to just be curious and just to keep following, you know, the uh, breadcrumbs, so to speak, because uh, now as an example, we mentioned Amy with the Airbnb, she didn't know that that was the thing. Um, But like one thing has led to the other and she's just continued to pursue it. You know, in the career that I'm in right now in helping other entrepreneurs generate recurring revenue with memberships. If you had asked me when I graduated university, if, you know, this was the thing, I'd be like, what are you talking about? Like, what, I I had no idea what even a membership was. And yet, you know, I, you just keep following the thing that leads to the thing that leads to the thing. And so I would just say, number one, like be curious and be open to, to following, you know, um, those things that you're passionate about. And then the second thing that I would say along those lines is, you know, once you do have your business up and going, I just really encourage you to take pride in the fact that you are an entrepreneur and you're able to take an idea and turn it into value that people pay for. And money is a very good thing. And be proud of the fact that you can make money because the more money you make, the more impact you can have. And so money is a very good thing. And once you become proud about being able to make money, you realize like, oh my gosh, there's so much opportunity to impact so many other people. And I I would just add to that as, as a parent, I think it's so important to, you know, follow the things that bring us passion because it brings out the best version of who we are. But more important is that is we've got to show our kids what's possible. Like they are looking to us every day and we can show our kids what's possible by just us living our life and going after those things and making hard decisions and, you know, following that passion. We've got to show them what's possible because they're watching us and we need to kind of, you know, we tell them to dream big and to do all these things, but you know, if we're not showing that and showing them what's possible in our own lives, then you gotta think, what are we teaching them? Like we've got to show up and show them what's possible. You guys are amazing. Thank you so, 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 so much from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Oh, it's our pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for having us. (laughs) To learn more ways to deepen your intimacy and strengthen your relationship, make sure you watch this video next 